to the African History Network show. It is Sunday, May 2nd, 2021, and we are live. We're broadcasting on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, and my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. So share this broadcast on your social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in also. We're also broadcasting on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, uh, WFDF on their uh, Facebook page as well. All right, so um, we know that uh, the Kentucky Derby is ran in May. And the first Kentucky Derby uh, ran in 1875. A lot of people don't know that the first winner of the Kentucky Derby was a 19-year-old uh, African-American man named Oliver Lewis. And we know the um, Kentucky Derby um, uh, ran yesterday, ran uh, Saturday. And uh, Medina Spirit, the horse Medina Spirit won the Kentucky Derby. Now, Medina Spirit should never be confused with Funky Cole Medina, okay? Just so everybody understand. Okay, Funky Cole Medina will raise your spirit, but Funky Cole Medina should not be confused with Medina Spirit, okay? <laughs> There's a little tone look reference there. Okay. <laughs> um, but there's a deep, rich history of African Americans in horse racing. Now, when you watch the Kentucky Derby today, you wouldn't know that, right? And I've been, you know, studying this history, dealing with uh, African Americans and uh, the Kentucky Derby and horse racing, uh, going back to about 2011. And when I first started doing this research, um, I went to the Kentucky Derby's official website. They did not have information there dealing with African-American jockeys, okay, uh, winning the Kentucky Derby. Now, what's very interesting is that they had, um, they listed all the winners of the Kentucky Derby, starting with 1875, okay, starting in 1875. And they listed all the names and the names of the trainers. But they didn't have anything saying that these were African-American jockeys. So it was a few years ago that they started putting information there uh, on the Kentucky Derby website dealing with African-American jockeys. And, you know, 13 of the uh, 15 jockeys in the first Kentucky Derby, which was ran in 1875, 13 of them were African-American men. OK, many of them former slaves. So there's a there's a deep history also between um, there's a deep history between slavery and uh, African-American horse jockeys. Okay. So a lot of people don't want to deal with that history either. All right. Because, and once again, this ties into why America needs a massive history lesson, why America needs a massive history lesson. So we'll talk about that today. We'll, we'll deal with uh, black jockeys dominated horse racing, but were pushed out by racism. We'll deal with how that happened. Uh, also, uh, there was a topic that I wanted to deal with earlier in the week. We did not get a chance to uh, do it. Uh, the Griot.com and the Associated Press had an article from uh, April 25th, 2021. Despite racial reckoning, state efforts stall on reparations. Despite racial reckoning, state efforts stall on reparations. OK, now we've seen uh, different uh, uh, states, California, Maryland, New Jersey, New York and Oregon that um, have. Democrats were Democrats control state legislatures and we see them introduce uh, various bills hoping to revive proposals to study uh, the possibility of reparations, et cetera. All right. Now, uh, the state efforts, those state efforts have mostly stalled, raising questions about whether they can win enough support to succeed on a wide scale. Now, this go back and listen to the show that I did Friday. OK. That was Friday, uh, April 30th, Friday, April 30th and Thursday, April 28th. You know, now we talked about um, uh, uh, Joe Biden's uh, address to the joint session of Congress. We dealt with all that. We talked about the rebuttal from Tim Scott, Senator Tim Scott, Republican of South Carolina. And we properly framed the rebuttal as well. That rebuttal was the rebuttal that he delivered on behalf of the GOP. Now, even though he agreed with a lot of it on certain issues, Tim Scott disagrees with his party. OK, Tim Scott is at the, as far as Republicans go, especially Republicans in the Senate. Tim Scott is at the forefront of uh, police reform. where you have a lot of Republicans in the Senate who don't think police reform needs to take place. And they even said you even have Republicans in the Senate who have said because 
Derek Chauvin was found guilty, this means the system works. Found guilty for killing George Floyd. Many you have some Republicans now saying because Derek Chauvin was found guilty of killing George Floyd, this means the system works and you don't need police reform. Okay, Senator Tim Scott is leading the effort on behalf of Republicans to negotiate with Democrats, especially Congressional Black Caucus, when it comes to the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Now, what he's proposing does not go as far as it should. But what he's proposing goes farther than a lot of Republicans want and are advocating for. So we went through and dealt with uh, what the statements that were said, uh, said as well as the statements from uh, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris as well. And you have Democrats, and even when you when you read the full statements and listen to the full six minute and approximately 64, 54 uh, second interview she did with Good Morning America, and she talks about systemic racism and, and addressing systemic racism, legacy of Jim Crow slavery, uh, Jim Crow segregation, things like this, as well as the comments from Joe Biden. You read and listen to the full uh, rebuttal from Tim Scott, which is about 14 minutes and almost 15 minutes, and I've gone through and analyzed both of them. Republicans don't even want to don't even want to acknowledge that systemic racism exists. Republicans don't even want to acknowledge that systemic racism exists. Then when you try to address systemic racism, Republicans are calling that racism. When you try to put policies in place to address systemic racism, Republicans are calling the remedy racism and ignoring the 100 plus years of Jim Crow segregation and redlining and racism. So when we look at what's playing out in states like California, Maryland, New Jersey, New York, and Oregon, and despite a racial reckoning that took place in uh, summer of 2020 behind the killing of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and all this stuff, now when it comes time to actually deal with policies, you have Republicans who are, large, who are in denial. Senator Lindsey Graham just did an interview last week before uh, Tim Scott uh, did the rebuttal on behalf of Republicans. Senator Lindsey Graham said, Senator Lindsey Graham, the senior senator from South Carolina, the senior senator from South Carolina. Um, Tim Scott is the junior senator from South Carolina. Senator Lindsey Graham, former chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, is saying and has said in interviews that systemic racism in America does not exist. Now, only does Senator Lindsey Graham say that systemic racism does not exist, but Senator Lindsey Graham is attacking the $5 billion allocated to African-American farmers and, and farmers of color in the $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan that was designed to address a hundred years of racism and discrimination that farmers of color, especially African-American farmers, have, have endured because African-American farmers have lost 92% of their land, almost 12, uh, 12 million acres of land over the past 100 years because of being discriminated against getting loans from the federal government, um, uh, 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 discrimination from the uh, Farmers Home Administration, going back to the 1930s, all different types of things like this. So then when Senator Raphael Warnock of Georgia and Senator Cory Booker of New Jersey put the Justice for Black Farmers Act, when they, when they, put, when they allocate this money for African-American farmers and, and non-white farmers into the $1.9 trillion bill and it passes, now you have Republicans attacking the remedy as racism and ignoring, ignoring the previous 100 years of racism, especially against African-American farmers. Then, the day after Senator Tim Scott delivered his rebuttal on behalf of the GOP, on behalf of the Republican Party, that was Wednesday, April 28th. Wednesday, April 29th, you know what happened? A group of white farmers filed a lawsuit against the U.S. government claiming discrimination that, that they could not take advantage of the loan forgiveness that farmers of color are being able to take advantage of because of 100 years of discrimination against farmers of color. They're saying that constitutional rights are being violated. All of this is connected. So we're going to deal with all this on the other side of the break and deal with how black jockeys dominated horse racing, but were pushed out by racism. You listen to the African, you just listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation of Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes.
Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Sunday, May 2nd, 2021, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well. Uh, I want to remind you, you can still register for the online course that I teach. Uh, we just had a new section that started up. It started up Saturday, May 1st. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. We deal with thousands of years in history and what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. We had a great, great class on uh, Saturday, May 1st. Uh, this is a nine-week, 18-hour online course. Uh, it takes place Saturdays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's all online. You can watch in bed. You can see me. I can't see you. You can have your pajamas on if you want to. Um, we do the classes live. We have a live text chat as well, so you can ask questions during the class. All the sessions are recorded. All the sessions are recorded. So as soon as you register, you can watch the class that we just did Saturday, May 1st. And then the previous uh, offering of the course, we have that archive as well. You'll be able to watch that also. You can watch from around the world. I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have uh, uh, book references, articles, video clips. And we deal with thousands of years of history. We deal with ancient Africa. We deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. And we deal with what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. So we just posted the link here. It's also at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Class is regularly $130 on sale, $80. As soon as you register, you can start watching content and you'll still have access to all of the content once the course ends as well. Okay. All right. So right before the break, we we're, we're uh, giving you a brief overview of the topics we're going to cover today. And we're going to jump in dealing with uh, black jockeys dominated horse racing. Well, we're pushed out by racism in just a minute here. Uh, I was recapping some of the topics that we dealt with Thursday and Friday on our show. And we were dealing with the difference between statements that uh, Senator Tim Scott made on behalf of the GOP, on behalf of the Republican Party, and statements that uh, Vice President Kamala Harris, as well as uh, President Joe Biden made, and relating this to policy, relating this to policy, the $5 billion that's allocated in the $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan for African-American farmers and farmers of color, this is being attacked by Republicans. Senator, Senator Lindsey Graham, the senior senator from South Carolina who has 6,000 black farmers in South Carolina is not doing anything for them. That's not me saying that. That's John Wesley Boyd, Jr., president of the Black Farmers uh, Association. Senator Lindsey Graham is calling that allocation of $5 billion racist and saying white farmers cannot take advantage of it. Now, the most important thing about what Tim Scott said in his 14 minute plus rebuttal, almost 15 minutes, I've gone through and analyzed the entire thing as well as um, uh, the, uh, the statements from uh, the entire interview, six minutes and six, six minutes and about 54 seconds interview that Vice President Kamala Harris did with uh, George Stephanopoulos on uh, Good Morning America. Watch the entire interview, not just the excerpts that are in articles. Watch the entire interview. Also saw the entire interview that uh, Joe Biden did with Craig Melvin on MSNBC or, or NBC News. Tim Scott, after he said America is not a racist country, said that uh, using uh, race, he said, uh, and I have the exact quote here, he said it's bad to um, use discrim discriminatory laws to try to address uh, discrimination. OK, something to that effect is bad. It's uh, using discriminator discrimin discriminatory laws to address discrimination uh, is bad. What he's doing is he is attacking the and the Republicans are attacking the five billion dollars that's allocated for black farmers and farmers of color. That what the most important thing that he said was not America, it was not America's not a racist country, is what he said after that. Because when you try to use laws and policies to address the racism, Republicans are calling that racist. And that's this is why they don't want to acknowledge systemic racism exists. Because if you acknowledge systemic racism exists, then the next question you have to ask is what are you going to do about it? Senator Lindsey Graham, the senior senator from South Carolina, says systemic racism does not exist. Uh, Governor Ron DeSantis, we talked about this on Roland Martin Unfiltered on Friday. Governor Ron DeSantis, there was a there was a uh, a town hall meeting on Fox News last week at the Wednesday or Thursday. Governor Ron DeSantis was there. They're talking about racism. Is America racist? 
Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida says systemic racism does not exist. How are you going to deal with systemic racism if you don't even want to acknowledge that it exists? But Governor Ron DeSantis just signed a bill in the law that absolves people of any responsibility if they drive into a car and drive into a crowd of Black Lives Matter protesters and hit somebody and kills them. He just signed that bill in the law. We'll talk about this on Monday show. Let's deal with the black jockeys. And this ties into racism, but people don't want to acknowledge racism exists. Racism has nothing to do with not liking people, calling people racial epithets, calling people the N-word. That's bigotry. Racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race. Racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race. Racism occurs when one race of people control the majority of the wealth power, resources, benefits, privileges, land, access to education, access to opportunity, media, health care, and they use that, et cetera, and they use that to marginalize, subordinate, and do harm to another race of people. Racism comes out of the ideology of European white supremacy for the purpose of preserving genetic white survival. No wonder they don't want to admit it exists. So when we look at the history of African-American jockeys, this takes us back into slavery, and that's something that a lot of Republicans don't want to talk about. Black jockeys won 15 of the first 28 of America's most important horse races at Churchill Downs. In fact, every rider of, uh, on the track at the inaugural Kentucky Derby in 1875 was African-American, except for one. Okay, some sources say 13 out of 15, some sources say 14 out of 15. Okay. The race was won by Oliver Lewis. Now, some accounts say Oliver Lewis was a former slave. He, he was 19 years old. His, his trainer, his trainer's name was Ansel Williamson. Ansel Williamson was a former slave. Now, there was a time when riding a racehorse was almost exclusively a black occupation. And I've done an entire presentation, entire lecture dealing with this. So I'm going to show you some of the slides from my presentation as well, if you don't mind. So there was a time when riding a racehorse was almost exclusively a black occupation. That's something else we got pushed out of. It began with plantation owners using lightweight uh, African-American slave boys to race their horses against rival owners. Some slaves were tied to horses to keep them from falling off resulting in injury and sometimes death. Now, there are numerous sources you can check out dealing with this. And we're going to go to clip one in just a second, Jalen. There are numerous sources that you can uh, check out dealing with uh, this history. I've looked at a number of them. I've also been on the Kentucky Derby's website and done research there on the Kentucky Derby's website. Uh, one article is from SmithsonianMag.com, official website of the Smithsonian Institute. They have a really good article, the Kentucky Derby's Forgotten Jockeys, the Kentucky Derby's Forgotten Jockeys. And if you see Lindsey Graham or if you, if you see uh, Ted Cruz or if you see uh, Ron DeSantis, um, I always find it interesting. See, we have to get the language right and we have to deal with definitions. So first question I would ask them when they say uh, racism doesn't exist or systemic racism doesn't exist, I would ask them, please define for me racism or systemic racism. So if we look at this article here, the Kentucky Derby's forgotten jockeys, African-American jockeys, African-American jockeys once dominated the track, but by 1921, they had disappeared from the Kentucky Derby. How did that happen? How did, did, did the horses just all of a sudden get afraid of black men that they didn't want to race for them? No, that's not what happened. It was systemic racism that pushed black jockeys out of horse racing. This is Jimmy Wink Winkfield, who won the Kentucky Derby twice in 1901 and 1902. He was the last African-American winner of the Kentucky Derby. Jimmy Wink Winkfield. Let's go back to the, I want to go back to my slides here. But that's an article you can check out. 
also if you want uh if you want to order the lecture i've done dealing uh, with this we have it at our website africanhistorynetwork.com when black men dominated horse racing uh that's at africanhistorynetwork.com okay so here we have uh pictures of some of the african-american winners of the kentucky derby oliver lewis won in 1875 then we have isaac murphy William Walker and also Willie Sims, all African American men. Now, uh, horse racing was entertaining for white owners and for slaves alike, and one of the few ways for Af for slaves to achieve status. What's important for people to understand? You've heard me talk about the history of slavery before, and and I deal with how there were at least two hundred and uh, 62 skills, trades, and crafts that African people had in this country from 1619 to 1865, uh, at least 262 skills, trades, and crafts. If you had a talent that allowed white people to make money off of, if you could box, if you could wrestle, if you uh, uh, were a jockey, if you could ride horses or something like this, you got an elevated status. Oftentimes you could travel. And you can make money yourself when we when, when you watch Roots and you deal with Chicken George, Chicken George. Um, well, uh, Chicken George uh, helped to raise uh, 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 roosters. OK. And he was involved in cockfighting. He traveled around with his master, played by Chuck Connors. And his master was his father. Also, it's a whole nother story because um, Chuck Connors, uh, the, the slave master, uh, raped Kizzy. OK. Uh, Chicken George's mother. So if you had skills like that, right, you could have an elevated status and have more freedoms and travel and sometimes make money. Chicken George made enough money uh, betting on on uh, on the cockfights, things like this. He was able to buy his freedom. So this is why we really, really need to study the history of slavery in this country and the chronology of this history to really understand what happened and where we are today. So black jockeys won 15 of the first 28 of America's most important horse races at Churchill Downs. OK, that's where the Kentucky Derby's ran. In fact, every rider on the track at the inaugural Kentucky Derby in 1875 was black except one. That race was won by a former slave named Oliver Lewis. Now. Uh, you hear uh, here on 19 a.m. Superstation WFDF, their airing was known as the Triple Crown. The Triple Crown consists of three races. OK, the Triple Crown is not. The, the Triple Crown is more than the Kentucky Derby. The Triple Crown consists of the Kentucky Derby, the Preakness and the Belmont Stakes. OK, these are the three most coveted races in horse racing. All right. So the Triple Crown consists of three races. The Kentucky Derby is the first one. And we were winning all these races. All right. And. We were winning races in Europe also. These were some bad brothers. These were like, these are looked at as the first African-American athletes. And then after slavery ends, they're still winning. You're going into the Reconstruction era. Now, these colorful characters included uh, Kentucky Derby winners like Willie Sims, who introduced the short stirrup into the profession. Isaac Murphy, the Derby's uh, first three-time winner. And Jimmy Wink Winkfield, who I just showed you a picture of on the horse, uh, who finished all four uh, Kentucky Derbies he rode in the money, winning uh, winning twice. He won in 1901 and 1902. You have Babe Hurd, Babe Hurd, H-U-R-D, Soup Perkins, Alonzo Lonnie Clayton, Erskin Henderson, and Billy Walker. These were all African-American men, all Kentucky Derby winners. Are they teaching your children about this in school? I'm just curious. Are they teaching your children about this in school? So the question you have to ask is, well, what had happened? <laughs> you say, wait a second. Because because you, you think of horse racing, you think of that as a white, a white sport, a, a, a white wealthy sport. You don't think of that as a poor man's sport. OK, horse racing. OK, <laughs> so you have to ask the question, well, what happened? All right, let's go to I want to go to clip one here. This is from uh, this is from the Kentucky Derby. This is from the Kentucky Derby's website. 
And this clip, this then this did not exist back in 2011 when I started doing research on this, right? But this deals with um, African American jockeys and the Kentucky Derby. Let's go to this clip, uh, Jalen. The Kentucky Derby and Churchill Downs have become American institutions since their debuts in 1975, and countless individuals have contributed to their ongoing growth. Prominent among them are the African-American jockeys and trainers who helped build the early foundation of success that now spans nearly a century and a half. Thirteen of the 15 horses that competed in that first derby in 1875 were written by African-Americans. When Oliver Lewis guided Aristides to victory for African-American training legend and eventual Hall of Famer Ansel Williamson in that first derby, the victory was one of 15 by African-American riders in the first 28 runnings of the race. Three of those history-making jockeys are enshrined in Racing's Hall of Fame, three-time derby winner and national racing hero Isaac Murphy, and two-time derby winners Jimmy Wheatfield and Willie Sims. Also prominent is William Walker Sr., who was born in slavery and, at the age of 17, piloted Baden-Baden to win the 1877 Derby. During a 60-year career, Walker also trained horses and was a bloodline consultant to John E. Madden, who bred five Kentucky Derby winners. Those men, along with fellow Derby winners Lonnie Clayton, Erskine Henderson, Babe Hurd, George Garrett Lewis, Isaac Lewis, and Sue Perkins, were among the brightest stars in American racing before government-sanctioned Jim Crow laws and the poison of racism push them from their hard-earned prominence. Their legacy is now restored, and the accomplishments of the early African-American heroes of the Kentucky Derby are honored at Churchill Downs during Derby Week for the annual running of the William Walker Stakes. All right. So that gives a little background um, history here on the legacy of African-American jockeys. All right. And... Um, it's a little known history. More has been talked about in the past few years. I know there was a big article from uh, the root.com around 2011. Uh, you have the article from um, uh, SmithsonianMag.com uh, that uh, we talked about a few minutes ago. But it's a, a history that is uh, still hidden. Okay. So when I, when I hear people say, when I hear, Republic, especially Republicans, um, say that systemic racism doesn't exist. So we dealt with that before you dealt with it. Um, you dealt with it, but it, you didn't fix it. It's still here. Then when you try to put policies in place to, uh, to address systemic racism, then they want to say that's racist. OK, this is the this is the game that's being ran. All right, so um, I want to go back to the uh, I want to go back to the presentation here, and the calling number is three one three seven seven eight seventy six hundred three one three seven seven eight seventy six hundred. If you have a quick question or comment, also. Okay, so if you were uh, uh, if you were a slave who had skills that white people can make money off of then you could also make some money also. You could have more freedoms and you can make some money as well. So when the first Kentucky Derby was ran May 17th, 1875, 13 out of 15 jockeys were African-American. Among the first 28 Derby winners, 15 were African-American. African-American jockeys excelled in the sport of horse racing in the late 1800s. But by 1921, they had disappeared from the Kentucky racetrack and would not return until Marlon St. Julian rode in the 2000 race. Are we to believe that horses started hating black people so they didn't want to they 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 didn't want a black jockey to ride them? And then in 2000 all of a sudden horses started liking black people again? Is that is that why uh we got pushed out of horse racing? Mm, I don't think that's what happened. See see one of the things that happened was that as long as white men could make money off of us when we were slaves, it was all right. When we could make money for ourselves and we're winning the horse races after slavery and we can make money for ourselves, all of a sudden, now it's a problem. All of a sudden, now it's a problem. So African-American jockeys' dominance 
in the world of horse racing is a history nearly forgotten today. Nearly forgotten today. Their participation dates back to colonial times when the British brought their love of horse racing to the New World. New World, new to them, wasn't new to us. Because if you read The First Americans Were Africans, documented evidence by Dr. David M. Hotel. And if you take my online class, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Maafa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. If you've seen any of the approximately 16 interviews I've done with Dr. David M. Hotel, you know that African people were here in this land that we call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years ago. We were here before Native Americans even came into existence. There's no disrespect to Native American brothers and sisters because I have Cherokee and Black Crow in my family on my mother's side. I'm just dealing with the history. So it was, it was new to them. It wasn't new to us. Yes, the transatlantic slave trade did happen, but that happens thousands of years later. But it was new to them. It wasn't new to us. So founding fathers, or as Dr. Francis Cress Wilson calls some of them, the fondling fathers, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson frequented the track, the race track. And when uh, President Andrew Jackson, the white supremacist Andrew Jackson, who was Donald Trump's favorite president, surprise, surprise, when President Andrew Jackson moved into the White House in 1829, he uh, brought along his best thoroughbreds and his black jockeys. He was a white supremacist. <laughs> he was, he, it, Andrew Jackson, Andrew Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act of 1830, okay? He signed the Indian Removal Act of 1830. Also, Lewis Cass, that Cass Tech is named after, former slave owner Lewis Cass. Now, some people say he only owned one slave, okay. Lewis Cass was involved in the Indian Removal. In the removal of the Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek, Cherokee, and Seminole Indians off their land in southeastern United States. So when some people say Cast Tech needs to be renamed, and I'm one of them, I'm a graduate of Cast Tech. People who respect themselves don't name their institutions of learning or higher learning after their oppressors. They don't name institutions of higher learning after people who work to oppress their people and keep their people enslaved. They name their institutions after their freedom fighters and people who work to free them. That's just a side note there. You can do some research on that. So when President Andrew Jackson moved into the White House, he thought African people were mentally inferior. He uh, pushed the, uh, he signed the Indian Indi Removal Act of 1830, pushed the Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek, and Cherokee and Seminole Indians off their land in the southeastern United States forced them to go over a thousand miles out west into Oklahoma on what's known as the Trail of Tears. And about a third of the people that were with those five Native American nations, about a third of them, a third of them were African people. Hmm. But he loved his black jockeys. So uh, in 1829, President uh, Andrew Jackson, when he moves into the White House, he brought along his best thoroughbred horses and his black jockeys. Because racing was tremendously popular in the South, it is not surprising that the first black jockeys were enslaved Africans. Hmm. I wonder how much money these enslaved Africans made for these white people. And many of their descendants now tell us to get over it. Well, that's because you got over on us. See, it's easy to say to get over it when you got over on us. It's easy to say move on when you got something to move with. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so this is Oliver Lewis. Oliver Lewis uh, won the Kentucky Derby in 1875, May 17th, 1875. The odds were good and in the first Kentucky Derby, that an African-American jockey would win the prestigious contest, and Oliver Lewis did so. Oliver Lewis was the very first Kentucky Derby uh, winner. His horse named Aristides uh, uh, was, was the trainer of his horse, Aristides, was a uh, former slave named Ansel Williamson, Ansel Williamson. In addition to this famous first, Oliver Lewis became an analyzer of racing data. He became, a, he became an analyzer of racing data. His work became very influential in the forming 
of modern race charts. So not only, not only when you study the history of this, not only were these brothers winning the horse races, but they're going to change horse racing. They're going to change the style because we bring style and flair and swagger to whatever we do. They're going to change horse racing. Now, this is Jimmy Wink Winkfield who lived from 1882 to 1974, Jimmy Wink Wingfield. Okay, he wins the Kentucky Derby twice. In 1901, at age 19, at age, in 1901, at age 19, Jimmy Wink Wingfield captured his first Kentucky Derby title uh, astride a horse named Eminence. He went on to win 161 races that year. 161 races in 1901, including key victories, in the Latania uh, Derby on Hernando and Tennessee Derby where uh, the horse Hernando and the Tennessee Derby where he rode Royal Victor. OK, there's an um, article about Jimmy Wink Winkfield at BlackPass.org. These brothers were not only winning horse races. But they changed horse racing, they revolutionized horse racing. Here's Jimmy Wink Winkfield in 1902 winning the Kentucky Derby. While these were spectacular accomplishments, he returned uh, to the Kentucky Derby in 1902. So he won in 1901 and 1902 um, and, and won the most important race of his career in 1902. 1902 was the last time an African-American jockey won the Kentucky Derby. So much for systemic racism doesn't exist. Now, this is William Walker. William Walker won the Kentucky Derby when he was 17. Now, William Walker won the Kentucky Derby in 1877 ab aboard the horse named Baden Baden. Walker's most famous race at Churchill Downs came in 1878 when he piloted Teen Broick to win uh, over uh, the horse Molly McCarthy in a famous uh, match race. William Walker was considered an expert in thoroughbred breeding and bloodlines. Eventually, he became an advisor to John E. Maiden, a breeder of five Kentucky Derby winners. Okay, this is information right uh, from uh, derbymuseum.org. So when you, when you study our history, see, we had, um, when you look at the 262 skills, trades, and crafts that African people had in this country from 1619 to 1865, even though we hear we're here for tens of thousands of years before that, but just look at that period of time. We had experience working with animals and raising animals and things like this. So many of the best trainers were African-Americans also. Somebody needs to do a study on how much money did African-American jockeys make white people? How much money did African-American jockeys make white people? Not just their trainers, but the white people who are betting on them. All right, I want to bring up uh, this other picture here. Let's see here. Okay. Calling numbers 313-778-7600 if you have a, a quick question or comment also. 313-778-7600 if you um, have a quick question or comment. All right, I want to go back and uh, look at some more of this information here. And I'm going, uh, I'm looking, I have notes on this, but also my presentation. So I'm going to uh, go back between the two of them. So uh, please forgive me in advance on that. So after the Civil War, which had devastated racing in the South, uh, many, uh, many of the tracks destroyed and a lot of the South destroyed, things like this. Okay. Emancipated African American jockeys followed the money to racetracks. Up north, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. Now, these colorful characters included uh, Kentucky Derby winners like Willie Sims, who introduced a short stirrup to the profession, uh, Isaac Murphy, Babe uh, Hurd, Sue Perkins, Jimmy Wink Winkfield. And these were, these were usually very young men, sometimes many of them still in their teens. Isaac Murphy turned pro at age 14. 
Isaac Murphy turned pro at age 14. Alonzo Lonnie Clayton won the Kentucky Derby at age 15. Jimmy Wink Winkfield won his first Kentucky Derby at age 19. Two years later, William Walker, who I just showed you a picture of, and we have a picture of William Walker up right now. William Walker won the Kentucky Derby at age 17. This is Willie Sims over to the right. He's on his horse. It looks like he's on his horse, has his hand up in the air. That's Willie Sims. That's Isaac Murphy. Okay. Uh, all the way to uh, all the way to uh, the left is Oliver Lewis, who won the first Kentucky Derby. Then we have Isaac Murphy. These were some bad brothers. Now, Isaac Murphy became the first jockey to win three Kentucky Derby, three Kentucky Derbies in 1884, 1890, and 1891. This is a few years after, you know, 15, 20 odd years after slavery ends, ends 1865. Okay. He wins three Kentucky Derbies, uh, Isaac Murphy, 1884, 1890, and 1891. And he won an amazing uh, 44 percent of all of the races that he rode in. He rode an amazing 44 percent of all of the races that he rode in, a record still unmatched today. Uh, I want to go to uh, clip two. We're going to uh, go to clip two for a few minutes before the break, Jalen. Also, if you like this type of information here, you can support the African History Network. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. And through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, or at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You're not going to get a lot of this type of information in many other places. When you do it through Cash App, be sure to type in dollar sign the AHN show, and it'll say Michael and show my picture there. Let's go to clip two, Jalen. This gives some more background uh, history on African American jockeys and horse racing. <laughs> African-American jockeys were a huge part of the very first Kentucky Derby in 1875. 13 of the 15 jockeys were African-American. And, of course, the race was won by an African-American jockey, Oliver Lewis. Uh, even beyond that, 15 of the first 28 runnings of the Kentucky Derby were won by African-American jockeys. In the 1800s, the institution of slavery created a workforce that helped make Kentucky the center of the horse racing universe. Slaves were taking care of the horses. Uh, in all facets, that included even jockeys. So the original jockeys were slaves. Uh, you'll hear names like Simon, a very prominent slave jockey who rode a horse named Haney's Maria, who beat General Andrew Jackson's horses on several occasions. And it continued as we get past the Civil War in 1865. Without the black jockeys, there would have been very little racing in Kentucky. And Kentucky became the mecca of uh, African-American jockeys. Willie Sims was from Georgia, Alonzo Clayton was from Kansas, but they all came into Kentucky to gain their reputation. Well, when we look at some of the jockeys that dominated the very earliest Kentucky Derbies, uh, Jimmy Wingfield, who won two Kentucky Derbies, Isaac Murphy is probably the name that you're gonna hear most associated with uh, dominant jockeys in the early Kentucky Derby. Uh, not only was he, he was one of the greatest jockeys really of all time, and is still recognized as such, the first jockey to win three Kentucky Derbies and was the very first jockey to be admitted to Racing's Hall of Fame in 1955. Isaac Murphy gained a reputation as a gentleman. He was also known for his great love for his wife, Lucy. A lot of jocks back then, nobody thought anything about throwing a race. He never threw a race. He was known for his uh, his honesty, that he put him up on a horse, that he would do the best he could to win. All right, pause, pause right there, Jalen, and back it up. Uh, back it up from the big, back it up about a minute or so. We're gonna pick this up on the other side of the break. Uh, and this is Isaac Murphy, and I know what you're thinking. Yes, his wife was black. Okay, you listen to that because <laughs> I know somebody was sitting there wondering, was his wife black? Yes, she was. Listen to the African History Network show right here on that 10 a.m. Superstation, the future radio. I'm your host, brother Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. 
Detroit, 910 AM Superstation, a division of Adele Media. The views and opinions expressed on any program are those of the producers and or the persons appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of 910 AM Superstation or Adele Media. All right. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Sunday, May 2nd, 2021. Uh, call in numbers 313-778-7600 if you have a quick question or comment. We know the Kentucky Derby um, ran on uh, Saturday, May 1st, 2021. And we're dealing with some of the history of African-American jockeys uh, who dominated the Kentucky Derby. Okay. And a lot of people don't, uh, you know, know about this history. So the uh, race on May 1st um, was ran by, uh, was uh, won by uh, John Velasquez, who ran, uh, who, um, whose horse name was Medina Spirit. And as I said before, in the first hour, Medina Spirit should not be confused with Funky Cole Medina. Okay. Medina Spirit, right? <laughs> should not be confused with Funky Cole Medina. Okay. <laughs> But Funky Cole Medina will raise your spirit, okay? But it's not the <laughs> it's not the same as as Medina Spirit, who won the Kentucky Derby, okay? <laughs> but you know, is uh, well, there's a joke in there about it. Uh, well, let me see. How should I? <laughs> no, I shouldn't say. That. <laughs> there's a joke in there, right? About about being drunk on funky funky cold medina and a horse a woman that looks like a horse looking like a winner but <laughs> we're not gonna go there <laughs> all right 313-778-7600 is the calling number if you have a quick question or comment we'll go to the phone lines in just a minute here so right before the break i was sharing a clip here and this is dealing with some of the history of African Americans in uh, horse racing. This is uh, African American jockeys from Kentucky Life, K E T. African American jockeys from Kentucky Life, K E T. And uh, here we see uh, Isaac Murphy. So Isaac Murphy won the Kentucky Derby three times. Okay. Isaac Murphy is one of the greatest jockeys in the history of thoroughbred racing. Now, you don't hear a lot about Isaac Murphy. Um, and I truly really need to hear this history. See, this is uh, America has to have a massive history lesson. See, when I hear Republicans, white and some African Americans, Republicans, who say systemic racism doesn't exist, like Senator Lindsey Graham says systemic racism doesn't exist, he, he said that recently in interviews. They don't want to deal with history like this and how these brothers were pushed out of racing. They don't want to deal with the history of slavery and racism and Jim Crow segregation. Some of them think that talking about the history of racism is racism. Some of them think talking about the history of racism is racism. No, it's not. We're dealing with what happened. Now, when you when when Jews talk about the Holocaust. They don't say talking about the Holocaust is promoting the Holocaust. They understand what happened to Jews and Afro-Germans because Afro-Germans were being killed by Hitler and the Nazis. Afro-Germans, uh, uh, um, sterilization was taking place of Afro-Germans. We talked about that here on this show. But nobody says that if you talk about the history of the Holocaust, then that's somehow promoting the Holocaust and promoting what happened to the Jews. No, you teach the history to keep a catastrophe like that from happening again. But when the Holocaust did not take place here in the U.S., it's easy to talk. It's easier to talk about it. Because you can say that happened over there. That happened in Poland. That happened in Germany. That happened in France. That happened, you know, you can say it, it happened there. The, the Auschwitz, okay, the concentration camps, they were in Europe. They weren't here. But when the Holocaust takes place here, then the descendants of those who engineered the Holocaust, many of them don't want to talk about it. When the Holocaust takes place here, many of the other descendants of those who engineered the Holocaust 
and benefited from it, fi- benefited from it financially. Many of them don't want to talk about it. They want to say we already dealt with that. Systemic racism doesn't exist. So this is Jimmy Wink Wingfield. I'm sorry, this is Isaac Murphy. This is Isaac Murphy. Isaac Murphy is one of the greatest jockeys in the history of thoroughbred racing. He won the Kentucky Derby three times. First three-time winner of the Kentucky Derby was an African-American man. Imagine that. He won in 1884, 1890, and 1891. Isaac Murphy won in the traditional upright English style at a time when most American jockeys rode in the more common-seated position. Okay? These brothers are going to change horse racing. They're going to change how people dressed, okay, the type of stirrups they wore, all different types of things like this. These brothers are going to revolutionize horse racing. Okay, let's go to the phone lines quickly. Let's go to Marathon Line 1. Marathon, welcome to the African History Network show. Tell us who you're calling from, Marathon. I'm calling from Tool Productions in Detroit. Okay. I was uh, fascinated by the um, program. I'm an entertainer, and I'm understanding my place in the world and why whites are interested in what I'm doing. Okay. And it, it's more clear to me now. Okay. All right. Well, thank and you. So I have to, mm-hmm. Go ahead. I have to be wise in my choices. You have to be what about your choices? Why? Why? Why is about and your choices? choices on, on, on who I partner with. That is true. That is true. All right, brother, we're getting some feedback. All right, brother, keep listening, Marathon. Thanks for calling. Okay. All right. Um, let's go to uh, let's go to Carl quickly on line two. Carl, welcome to the African History Network show. Tell us where you're calling from, Carl. Yes, I'm calling from Southfield, Michigan. Southfield, Michigan. Okay, yes. go ahead. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, you're absolutely right. The Holocaust, African Americans here, that's, it happened to our people. The, the problem is, that you've been in all this racism in this country, you never gave us our reparations. And black folks, African Americans, yes, we can get our reparations. In several ways, we can get it. It's all, all the laws that's been put on the books, all the segregation laws. White folks, white American citizens make law, have made laws, segregation laws, slave laws, etc., to hurt other citizens of the United States. How is that so? How can you be a citizen? here in America, that we're protected under the Constitution, Bill of Rights, all the amendments, and a whole group of other people. And here's the thing about it. White folks in this country, a lot of them, didn't come into this country until after World War II, and then it came in uh, when they came to Ellis Island in the 1800s. So, so black folks, they get, they get really white supremacy. See, that's why when you hear, that where I have worked and went to school, okay. with, uh, white folks and racist white folks. I'll say the same thing. But here's the thing. To get rid of white supremacy in this country, you have to pay us reparations. I got the bill on it. I know everything needs to be uh, dealt with that. For policing, you have to you have to pass that federal, that George Floyd crime bill. Now, I'm interested to see jo- how the George Floyd is. Justice and Policing Act? The George Floyd Justice and Policing Act is in the Senate right now? Yes. Okay. All right. Yes. Okay. So, because, you know, I just want to say one more thing. See, oh, when, they, when police fill out the, uh, not all police, but you have, you have tens of thousands, you've got over a million law enforcement in this country, 18,000 uh, uh, agencies in this country. you got at least around about 30% uh, uh, police in this country is corrupt. That's being real, because I'm an American citizen. I know my country. I know okay. how racist this country is. Jim Scott sit up there and said, the America, and, and Kamala Harris says it's not a racist country. Yes, it is. Mm-hmm. Yes, it is. It, 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 I, I would it, 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 if, if you if, if you if, if if you saw my show Friday, we went through and dealt with their comments, and we dealt with the totality of their comments. Oh. What 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 what, Senate, what Vice President Kamala Harris is saying is much different than Tim Scott. Tim Scott in his state in, yeah. in, in in his fourteen minute plus speech did not acknowledge that systemic racism existed, and then when you put policies in place to address systemic racism, Tim Scott said that uh, it's backwards to use discriminatory policies to fight against discrimination. What they we'll talk about this some more Monday. What they said are two entirely different things. But thanks for your call. Thanks for your call. Hey, keep yeah. keep listening, Carl. Yeah. Okay. Um uh, people go to Good Morning America, go to GMA.com and 
watch the entire six minute and 54 second interview that George Stephanopoulos did with Vice President Kamala Harris. Watch the entire interview. Watch it at the beginning when she talks about one of the biggest threats to America is white domestic terrorism. But Tim Scott didn't say that in, in his rebuttal speech on behalf of the GOP to the speech that uh, Joe Biden did. That wasn't, Tim, that wasn't Tim Scott's rebuttal. People have to understand. He delivered the rebuttal on behalf of the GOP to the speech that Biden delivered to a joint session of Congress. Now, he agrees with some of that stuff, but, but you have to understand. What he's saying is how most of these Republicans think. This is why most of them are saying systemic racism don't exist. Most of the Republicans are saying systemic racism does not exist. Therefore, when you put policies in place like the five billion dollars that's going to farmers of color, especially African-American farmers, that's in the one point nine trillion dollar American rescue plan. Republicans are calling that racist. There was a lawsuit filed Thursday, April 29th, the day after Biden gave his joint uh, gave his address to the joint session of Congress and. Tim Scott delivered his rebuttal on behalf of the GOP. There was a lawsuit filed by white farmers claiming that the five billion dollars going to African-American farmers and farmers of color is racism. And they, and they said they're being discriminated against because they can't take advantage of the 120 percent loan forgiveness and take advantage of the money. They skipped the 100 years of racism that caused the remedy to have to be put in place. We talked about this on our show Friday. If you miss any of our shows, go to our website, African History, go to our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network on Facebook. Go to my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. They're all there because we broadcast there. Okay? So we have to understand this. This is why you have to understand policy and politics. Politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties the adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. Uh, there was an article from the Columbus Dispatch. I'll, try, I'll have to find that article. We're going to go back to the clip here in just a second. Uh, so we have Isaac Murphy here. And then Isaac Murphy won an amazing 44% of all of his races, which is a record still unmatched. Uh, we have Alonzo Lonnie Clayton. Lonzo Lonnie Clayton was 15 years old when he won the Kentucky Derby in 1892. Uh, and when he became, the, he became the youngest rider to win the Kentucky Derby in 1892 at age 15. He was born on March 27th, 1876 in Kansas City, Missouri to Robert and Evelyn Clayton. On May 11th, 1892, Alonzo Lonnie Clayton won the Kentucky Derby where he recorded a time of uh, two minutes, 41, uh, two minutes, 41 seconds, riding the horse named Azra, A-Z-R-A. -A he also set a record as the youngest rider to win the prestigious race. Uh, let's go back to this uh, clip here, Jalen. This deals uh, more with African-American jockeys uh, and horse racing from Kentucky Life, K-E-T. Let's go to this clip was from Georgia, Alonzo Clayton was from Kansas, but they all came into Kentucky to gain their reputation. Well, when we look at some of the jockeys that dominated the very earliest Kentucky Derbies, uh, Jimmy Wingfield, who won two Kentucky Derbies, Isaac Murphy is probably the name you can hear most associated with uh, dominant jockeys in the early Kentucky Derby. Uh, not only he was one of the greatest jockeys really of all time and is still recognized as such. The first jockey to win three Kentucky Derbies and was the very first jockey to be admitted to Racing's Hall of Fame in 1955. Isaac Murphy gained a reputation as a gentleman. He was also known for his great love for his wife, Lucy. A lot of jocks back then, nobody thought anything about throwing a race. He never threw a race. He was known for his um, his honesty that if you put him up on a horse that he would do the best he could to win. While few relics remain from this era of racing in the African-American jockey, the Kentucky Derby Museum in Louisville has one that actually reminds us where the term for the winnings of a horse race originated. 
Well, the museum is very fortunate to have some artifacts directly related to uh, great jockey Isaac Murphy. One is a silk purse from the 1891 Kentucky Derby. The significance of that purse is that it would have contained the winning for that race. In the post-Civil War era, the racing the business that crossed racial lines between owners and jockeys. For them, there was only one color. If you get a jock who rides a horse and wins, you tend to want to stay with them. It's like they said on a racetrack, the only color that counts is green. I'm certain race was an issue when people came to bed. I'm not naive about it, but the thing about it is on a racetrack that you got to remember, if the best jock out there is a black jock and you want to bet on a white jock because you don't like black jockeys, you're literally going to be paying for your own prejudice because the black jockeys were enormously counted just as gifted as their white counterparts. Churchill Downs has the names of the horses who won the Derby, ridden by African Americans like Alonzo Clayton, Willie Sims, Billy Walker, and Sue Perkins. Everybody talks about his name, Sue, uh, James Sue Perkins, James Perkins was his real name, uh, but he was a very young jockey. He entered the racing industry at the age of 11, started really seriously becoming, making a name for himself at the age of 13. He lived in a house on Thomas Street, which was just behind the Kentucky Association racetrack over in the East End. And he talks about having jumped the fence to go into the uh, racing paddock, into the stables. His brothers, William and Frank, were trainers. And his father, John Jacob Perkins, was also a trainer. Like many African Americans in the area who worked at the racetrack, Sue Perkins is buried in the African Cemetery Number no. 2 on 7th Street. Tombstones, many weathered by time, tell their stories. Some tell of their occupation, like this bugler. One unidentified soul is marked simply with a horseshoe. It is the home to the first Derby winner, Oliver Lewis. Another tombstone shows how young these riders were. And one shows how appreciated the jockeys were to the riding stable. But sadly, one tombstone was removed. It now stands in the Derby Museum. Isaac Murphy's body was removed from the cemetery, eventually to be buried alone at the Kentucky Horse Park next to the statue of Manafort. While considered to be an honor and to share with the world this great name in horse racing, Isaac's beloved wife, Lucy, was left behind at the African Cemetery No. 2. Her body was left unmarked, forever lost, forever separated from her husband. As America grew into the 20th century, the era of dominance by African-American jockeys finally came to an end. First, as many former slave families migrated to the cities, but also with changes on the racetrack. During the last part of the 1890s, uh, there was uh, much contention between the black and white jockeys, and the racing industry became very dangerous for them. As racing becomes a more lucrative profession, and being a jockey becomes a more lucrative profession, uh, more white athletes are interested in the races and being a jockey. And we have record in the early 20th century of uh, many African-American jockeys like Jimmy Winkfield, uh, the last Af African-American jockey who won the Kentucky Derby. Uh, he was a victim of rough riding. And there are instances where he was in a race and jockeys were getting close to him, rough him up, running him up against the rail, uh, trying to intimidate him on the racetrack. Uh, when that starts to happen, trainers are reluctant to use African-American jockeys because they think it's a disadvantage to their horse. So you have just the outright racism of that time period that contributes to it. Okay, so that's some more uh, background information in history dealing with uh, African-American jockeys and how they were pushed out of horse racing. Um, we're going to deal, we're gonna, we'll talk about this some more on the other side of the break. This is the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation of Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation of Future Radio. Hey, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. 
It is Sunday, May 2nd, 2021, and we are live. 313-778-7600 is the call-in number. If you have a quick question or comment, 313-778-7600 is the call-in number. If you have a quick question or comment, be sure to follow us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network. And also uh, follow us on our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. And we rebroadcast these various shows throughout the day as well, okay, on my social media platforms. If you'd like this type of information, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. And also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. We have Pam, Tracy, uh, Sherwin, Sharon. There's a few of the people watching us on our social media platforms. A question came up in the chat uh, about the online course that I teach. Somebody said that they work on Saturday. Okay, we do the classes live. All of the classes are recorded. All of the sessions are recorded and archived. You can go back and watch it anytime. You can watch from around the world. Uh, so if you have to work on Saturday and can't join us live in the class, not a problem. You can watch the class whenever you get ready to. Even after the nine-week course is over with, you'll still have access to the course offerings, okay? So that's my online class, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. And you can register at, register at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And we'll post a link here. As soon as you register, you can watch the class that we did uh, Saturday, May 1st. And then the previous uh, course that we did February and March, you can watch that as well. All right, let's go back to um, the topic dealing with African-American jockeys. Black jockeys dominated horse racing, but were pushed out by racism. Black jockeys dominated horse racing, but were pushed out by racism. Oh, also, uh, I found an article from the Columbia Dispatch I was looking for. We talked about this on my show Friday. Uh, this deals with white farmers who are suing the U.S. Department of Agriculture, suing the federal government. OK. Uh, white farmers sue seeking loan forgiveness. Now, this is this is backlash from the five billion dollars being allocated in the one point nine trillion dollar American rescue plan. This is backlash. This is what Senator Lindsey Graham has been talking about. Senator Lindsey Graham has been attacking the five billion dollars, saying it's racist. OK, and saying that if you're a white farmer, you don't get anything. You don't get the loan forgiveness. Senator Lindsey Graham is ignoring previous 100 years of history that caused African-American farmers largely to lose 92 percent of their land, 12 million acres. We go from about a million African-American farmers in in 1920 to about 45,000 today. Senator Lindsey Graham and other Republicans, including Tim Scott, are ignoring uh, what Tom Vilsack, the, uh, the new Secretary of Agriculture, said in an interview with the Washington Post on May 25th, 2021. We talked about it here on this show. Okay. Agriculture Secret Secretary Tom Vilsack says only 0.1 percent, only 0.1 percent of Trump administration, Trump administration's COVID farm relief went to black farmers. Only 0.1 percent. Where is Senator Lindsey Graham? Where are all these Republicans calling the five billion dollars in the one point nine trillion dollar American rescue plan racist? Where, where were they when twenty six billion dollars? was handed out from the Trump administration and African-American farmers got 20.8 million. They got one-tenth of one percent. Where are all these people saying systemic racism doesn't exist? Of those who identified their race or ethnicity, black farmers received only 20.8 million of nearly $26 billion in two rounds of payments under the coronavirus food assistance program announced by the Trump administration in April of 2020. What were all these people saying systemic racism doesn't exist? 26 billion African American farmers got one tenth of 1%. This is one of the reasons why John Wesley Boyd Jr., president of the Black Farmers Association, this is why he's saying spineless Lindsey Graham owes the black farmers uh, an apology. 
Okay? And he's correct. We talked about this here on the show Friday. Go watch Friday's show where we got deep into it. Friday, April 30th. Black farmer Lindsey Graham must apologize for racist comment about subsidies kept from farmers of color for years. John, John Wesley Boyd Jr. is calling out punk ass Lindsey Graham. Lindsey Gra Lindsey Graham is doing interviews saying systemic racism does not exist, but he wants to ignore the past 100 years of racism coming from the federal government that caused black farmers to lose 92 percent of their land. From 1930 to 1939, black farmers lost over 200,000 farms. This is during the Great Depression, when when African American when white farmers were able to get loans from the federal government to save their farms and mechanize their farms. We were denied, we were denied a lot of a lot of those subsidies. And we go, we lose our farms. Read, read the book How White Folks Got So Rich, The Untold Story of American White Supremacy, third edition. How White Folks Got So Rich, The Untold Story of American White Supremacy, third edition, page 72. It deals with the Farmers Home Administration, created in 1930. This is under the Hoover, the Herbert Hoover administration. This is at the beginning of the, the Great Depression. The, the stock market crashes October 29, 1929. The Farmers Home Administration, the FHA, created in 1930. At the end of legal slavery in 1865, blacks were concentrated in the agricultural sector of America. They were more likely than whites to own farms, though they held less acreage and had poor quality tracts of land. Despite this reality, the Farmers Home Administration was set up in 1930 to give loans and subsidies to white farmers to sustain and maintain their operation, their operations. To achieve this unstated racist purpose, the Farmers Home Administration allowed local white farmers to operate the program and they, not the federal government, decided who would get the critical benefits. As a result, black owned farms unable to compete with the well subsidized as a result black owned farms unable to compete with the well subsidized and well financed white farms fell dramatically from about 900,000 in 1930 to 682,000 in 1939 it goes from 900,000 in 1930 to 682,000 in 1939 many of the whites Many of the white farmers used the government money to modernize their farms by buying tractors and evicting black sharecroppers during the Great Depression. The U.S. Congress amended the law to say that half of the money should go to those tenant farmers. But the white landholders simply stole the farmers payments, claiming if they were asked about it, that debts were owed. Uh, this is why they want to say systemic racism doesn't exist. Because they don't want to deal with the history. Because if you acknowledge systemic racism exists, then the next question is asked is, well, what are you doing about it? So they want to do presto change or hocus pocus. Systemic racism doesn't exist. We already dealt with it. When? All right, let's go back to the black jockeys who were pushed out of horse racing because of systemic racism <laughs> that doesn't exist. <laughs> okay. So, um, we talked about Oliver Lewis and Alonzo Lonnie Clayton. Now, let me see. We've got, uh, Isaac Murphy, Willie Sims, Willie Sims born 1870, uh, died in 1927. Willie Sims won the Kentucky Derby twice, 1896 and 1898. Willie Sims is also the first jockey to win a race with an American horse at an English race course and is credited with introducing the short stirrup riding style to England. These brothers are going to revolutionize uh, horse racing also. All right. Now, I want to deal with what happened. How did they get pushed out of horse racing? Did the horses just all of a sudden say, that we're, we're, we're white supremacist bigots now and we don't want black jockeys riding on our backs, okay? 
did, did, did they say get they said black man get off my back did they say get your knee off my neck what happened so the money ultimately led to the to the demise of african american jockeys according to researcher kenneth uh, uh wisenton w h i s e n t o n a retired sociology and business librarian from the Martin Luther King Jr. Public Library and Howard University's Founders Library in Washington, D.C. He says, quote, black jockeys did not just vanish from horse racing. They were banished from horse racing. Black jockeys didn't just vanish from horse racing. It wasn't presto change or where they go. I don't know what happened. Who knows? Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The shadow knows. It wasn't like what happened to them. No, it was a systemic, it was systemic racism. Now, as the thoroughbred horse racing industry grew in America, so did the size of the winning purses. So did the money. Follow the money. And the prosperity of black jockeys increased as the money increased. Why well, be damned? Why people got jealous? Now, as long as we were making the money when we were slaves, it was all good. But when we can make money for ourselves, right? When we make money for ourselves, it's like, hold on, hold on. No. <laughs> we, we get to keep more of the money, too. Slavery's over with. No, we get to keep more of the money. Oh, now all of a sudden, it's a problem. Less talented and envious white writers conspired to get in on the take. They conspired to get in on the take. This was a concerted effort. Now, New York Times had an article from 1900, the year 1900. Name of this article was Negro, Negro Jockeys Shut Out. Combination of white riders to bar them from the turf. This is from the New York Times in the year 1900. It told the whole story. Negro Jockeys Shut Out. Combination of white of white riders to bar them from the turf. So the New York Times article begins, quote, the decline of the Negro jockey has been so apparent since the season of 1900 opened that even the casual race goer, even the casual race goer has, has had an opportunity to comment, uh, comment upon it. The public generally accepted the theory that the old time favorites of African blood had outgrown their skill and really were out of date because of their inability to ride up to their form as of at the form of past years. OK, 1900, they're saying African blood. The public generally accepted the theory that the old time favorites of African blood had outgrown their skill and really were out of date because of their inability to ride up to their form of past years. The article went on to say, quote, racing men know better. Racing men know better. As a matter of fact, the Negro jockey is down and out, not because he could no longer ride, but because of a quietly formed combination to shut him out because of a quietly, a quietly formed combination to shut him out. So the Negro writers got months of, uh, got, got mounts at first. The Negro writers got mounts at first, but then failed to win races. Somehow or other, they met with all sorts of accidents and interferences in their races. There was a concerted effort by white men to conspire to sabotage their horses. Uh, when riding on the track, uh, other uh, riders would try to bump them to knock them out the race. The means employed to shut out the black riders are said to be that Whenever one of the prescribed jockeys participates in a race, there is a concerted action 
there is a concerted action by all the white boys to bring about the defeat of the horse ridden by the Negro. This is, this is a quote from the New York Times in 1900. This is why you have to study history. It, 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 it helps you to understand what happens today. And historical events don't happen in a vacuum. Okay, historical events don't happen in a vacuum. They are the culmination of a sequence of historical events. And also a people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. All right, let's continue here. So it goes, the means employed, quote, this is from the New York Times, 1900. The means employed to shut out the black riders are said to be that whenever one of the prescribed jockeys participates in a race, there is a concerted action by all the white boys, their word, not mine, to bring about the defeat of the horse ridden by the Negro, end quote. The singular ill luck, I-L-L, -L, the singular ill luck of black riders serves to remind possible employers that owners who expect to win races would only put up white jockeys. So they're saying if you want to win, if, if, if white owners are the horses, if they want to win, then don't run black jockeys anymore because we're going to sabotage them. We're going to run them out. They're going to be death threats. We're going to run them out of town and you're going to lose your money. OK, so put white jockeys in. There was a concerted effort to force African-American jockeys out of horse racing. Alonzo Lonnie Clayton was arrested. Let me see here. Do we have that in here? OK. Um, check out this article from the root.com called Silks, Saddles and Discrimination. Silks. Saddles and discrimination. It gives some more of this background history. Uh, Alonzo Lonnie Clayton, and we're going to pull up this picture again of uh, uh, Alonzo Lonnie Clayton. He was arrested shortly before post time at Aqueduct Racecourse, the racetrack, Aqueduct Racetrack and falsely accused of trying to fix the race, okay? This is, this is what they're doing to black jockeys because we're renting the horse races. You had some of these brothers making $20,000 a year in the late 1800s, early 1900s. These brothers sh shortened stature larger than life. These were like the first prominent African-American jockeys. So Alonzo Lonnie Clayton gets arrested at Aqueduct race, uh, Racetrack uh, shortly before post time and is, and is accused of trying to fix the race. A near riot broke out as barred black jockeys fought with white riders in Chicago. As barred black jockeys fought with white riders in Chicago. The African-American jockeys who remained in racing were reduced to exercise riders exercise riders, hot walkers, and stable hands, raking horse manure from barns. The once unsurpassable Alonzo Lonnie Clayton passed away at age 41. He was a bellboy at a Los Angeles hotel in 1917. This brother won the Kentucky Derby at age 15. He dies at 41. Some of them live tragic lives because they lost their fortune, they're forced out of horse racing, they have to go rake manure and become stable hands, all different types of things like this. Well, it was because of systemic racism. It wasn't because they didn't like the money. So white people are going to unionize. White men are going to unionize. The white jockey union movement started in the North and worked its way through the Midwest and then the South. For that reason, Jimmy Wink Wingfield was still able to ride and win the 1901 Kentucky Derby. OK, and in 1902. And this is uh, Jimmy Wink Wingfield right here. This is Jimmy Wink Wingfield running in 1902 winning the Kentucky Derby. 
He won in 1901, and then in 1902, he won the Kentucky Derby and became the last African-American to win the Derby. He ran his last race in the Derby in 1903, placing second before Churchill Downs succumbed to the pressure of the white union. A few African-American jockeys left the United States and went to Europe where they extended their careers. Jimmy Wink Winkfield was the most successful to do this, winning every major race on the continent on the continent of Europe, including Russia's Moscow Derby, France's uh, uh, pre de president, uh, pre du president uh, and Germany's uh, is it, a big race in Germany's Grosser praise uh, praise von Baden. In Germany, Jimmy Wink Winkfield made made and lost several fort fortunes in Russia. He lived in the Moscow National Hotel, owned a skating rink and held four percent of Russian railroad stock. This is Jimmy Wink Winkfield. OK. He. He lived in the Moscow National Hotel, owned a skating rink owned a skating rink and held 4% of Russian railroad stock. He developed a fondness for caviar at breakfast and chauffeur-driven Duesenberg cars. Legend had it, if you were an American tourist and bet on a race that he did not win, you simply brought your, you simply brought your betting ticket stubs to the hotel dining room where he would buy them back. Because Horse racing was tremendously popular in the South. It is not surprising that the first African-American jockeys were slaves. They cleaned the stables and handled the grooming and training of some of the country's most valuable horses. From such responsibility, African slaves developed the abilities needed to calm and connect with thoroughbred horses. And these were skills demanded by successful jockeys now because of racism though and white people became jealous of the money they were making they were forced out of horse racing the rising scourge of segregation began seeping into horse racing and then you have plessy versus ferguson u.s supreme court case of uh 1896 And we're going to look at that here quickly. All right. So you have uh, racism seeping in to uh, horse racing and, and segregation because of uh, Plessy versus Ferguson uh, U.S. Supreme Court case. Let me flip back over here to the slide. All right. So Plessy versus Ferguson, U.S. Supreme Court case of 1896 legalizes segregation. Separate but equal. You have a you have economic recessions of the period that take place. You uh, and the economic recessions shrunk the demand for black jockeys as racetracks closed and attendance failed. You had an intensified competition for uh, horse mounts. Violence on the racetracks against African-American jockeys by white jockeys prevailed without recourse. Jimmy Wink Winkfield received death threats from the Ku Klux Klan. You had anti-gambling groups that campaigned against racing, causing more closures, okay, and also uh, more closures of the racetracks. And then also the northern migration of African-Americans, uh, so the Great Migration, 1915 to 1970, the northern migration of African-Americans from southern farming communities further contributed to the decline of African-American jockeys. But largely, you had a unionized effort of white men to force African-Americans out of horse racing as well. So these are contributing factors. All right. OK. Uh, also, if you want to order the lecture that I've done dealing with uh, black jockeys and horse racing. That's at our website, uh, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Um, that is 
uh, how black how black jockeys dominated horse racing then were pushed out but what's what's the name of that one uh when black men dominated horse racing that's the name of it. when black men dominated horse racing we'll post the link here also okay i want to deal with i want to go to the second topic here uh we also have the bundle pack uh six dvd bundle pack six dvd bundle pack um what's the name of that one uh Black Migration, 1619 to 2019. Black Migration, 1619 to 2019. That's a six DVD bundle pack. And the lecture dealing with uh, uh, when black jockeys dominated horse racing, that is one of the six uh, DVDs in that bundle. We also have it in a digital download format also. So that's at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Let's see here. We'll post the bundle here. Okay, yeah, here we go. All right, I want to go quickly to this next topic here because I wanted to deal with this earlier in the week and did not get a chance to uh, discuss it. Uh, this deals with efforts at the state legislature level, efforts at the state legislature level to somehow deal with reparations, okay? And we know we hear more talk about reparations. Now, some of the talk is just nonsense. Others is more realistic. Okay. Uh, it takes 218 votes to get any bill passed in the House of Representatives. We had Cam Howard from Encobra, National Co National Male Co-Chair of Encobra here on the show a couple of weeks ago, two or three weeks ago. And we dealt with H.R. 40. And we know H.R. 40 passed out of the House Judiciary Committee. Okay. Uh, we don't know when it's going to go to the House floor for a full vote. I don't think you had 218 votes in the House of Representatives to pass it. All the Democrats are not on board with H.R. 40, even though a majority of them are. You have a, between 173 and 190 Democrats that will vote for it. No Republicans are going to vote for it. Not even uh, Burgess Owens of Utah, who's in the House of Representatives. He's black, but he don't think like it. OK, he's not voting for reparations. Senator Tim Scott. Black Tea Party Republican from South Carolina. He already said he's not voting for H.R. 40. He's not voting for reparations. If so, when it goes to the Senate, it's dead on arrival in the Senate. You, you're not going to have 60. You need 60 votes in the Senate to pass H.R. 40. I don't even think you have 40. No Republicans are going to vote for it. If the black Republicans are not going to vote for it, how many white Republicans you think are going to vote for it? It's not going to happen. Until maybe 2023, because you, you're going to need 60 votes. So you're going to have to vote a lot of Republicans out of office and vote people in the office who support H.R. 40. I don't know any Republicans that do. Maybe you know some, but I, I haven't seen any. I haven't seen any Republicans in the Senate say they support H.R. 40. So this next article here, this next uh, topic, this deals with. Um, despite racial reckoning. States stall on reparations. Despite racial reckoning, states stall on reparations. Okay, imagine that. So during um, the summer of 2020, reckoning over racial uh, injustice and decades long debates about whether to offer reparations to the descendants of enslaved Africans, okay, in the US. Uh, the, the, that whole debate game momentum, and we go back to June 19th, 2019, in the House of Representatives, uh, the how thing was the House Oversight Committee. There was a hearing on reparations. Burgess Owen spoke there. Okay, he said he was against reparations at the hearing, and then he and the one that just happened in February, he spoke there again, said he was against reparations. So did Larry Elder, African American conservative talk show host. He said he's getting reparations as well. But state lawmakers in California, Maryland, New Jersey, New York and Oregon, where Democrats control the legislatures and introduce or hope to receive proposals, introduce or hope to receive proposals to study the possibility of reparations. 
it turns out the wait for reparations will continue because these efforts are stalling. These efforts are largely stalling in the state legislatures. All right, let's look at this article here. Let me close that. All right. So in the state efforts, so, so the state efforts uh, have mostly stalled raising the question about whether they can win enough support, whether they can win enough support to succeed on a wide scale uh, basis. Now, California is the only state to approve a commission to study reparations statewide and how they might work. Okay, California is the only state out of California, Maryland, New Jersey, New York, and Oregon. California is the only state to approve a commission to study reparations statewide and how they how they might work. Now, Juanica Fisher, a Democrat who introduced the legislation uh, in the state of Maryland said, we need a federal reparations bill, but I don't know when we'll get there, me either. She said, we need a federal reparations bill, but I don't know when we'll get there. And she's a Democrat who introduced the legislation. She's a Democrat who introduced uh, the legislation uh, in Maryland, okay? Now, uh, the state efforts have mostly stalled raising questions about whether they can win enough support. Let me scroll down here just a second. She said, hopefully we will, hopefully we will win, but I think the states, hopefully we will win, but I think states should be accountable. I think states should be accountable. Yeah, states that have slavery, you know, they should be, they should be accountable. The biggest success is going to, well, you can do short term at the state level. The most results are going to come from the federal level. Now, that mirrors the outlook in Congress, a committee in the U.S. House of Representatives, which is controlled by Democrats, advanced a decades old bill that would establish a reparations commission. But its prospects appear dim in the evenly divided Senate, 50 Democrats, 50 Republicans, where it's unlikely to generate enough support to overcome a filibuster where you need 60 votes. You're going to need 60 votes in the Senate. That, that doesn't exist right now. A lot of legislation and the things we work on are all band-aids on the issue of institutional racism, class inequality, and the host of, and the host of other issues that stem from that, said uh, Fisher who plans to reintroduce her bill next year. But we've never fully tackled what's at the heart. What's the cancer? What's the disease? Okay, you're done with racism and white supremacy. The lack of progress reflects the nation's, the lack of progress reflects the nation's conflicting views on whether reparations to atone for slavery are necessary. A 2019 Associated Press NORC uh, Center for Public Affairs research poll found that the vast majority of African Americans, 74 percent, favored reparations, but less than a fifth of white Americans favor reparations. I wonder why. What, 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 don't they understand history? I'm trying to tell you, most Americans don't understand history. OK. All right. Those watching on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, the African History Network and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. Keep watching. We're going to keep going for a few more minutes. Um, remember, right now is correct. Wrong behavior is not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you tomorrow night. Peace. All right. Stand by. Stand by. OK. We'll continue for a few more minutes. Um, so we have the bundle pack. Uh, black migration 16 19 to 2019 black migration 16 19 to 2019 and that's at our website africanhistorynetwork.com uh that also includes the uh we have it on the home page of our website as well and that includes the uh presentation when um black men dominated horse racing that's the full presentation it's a visual presentation 
and include some of my other presentations as well. Uh, one dealing with black migration, 16, 19, and 2019. Also six principles of political self-defense, understanding how laws and policies impact the economic conditions of African-Americans. Uh, ancient Africans in America, before Native Americans, before Columbus or slavery from Kemet to Wakanda. I have one dealing with the history why African Americans switched from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party, that whole history going back to the Lily White movement in 1928. Also one dealing with the whole history of Juneteenth as well. Okay, this is a six DVD bundle pack. Um, you can order them individually also. Down below we have the individual uh, lectures that are in the bundle pack also. So that's on sale uh, $45. We have that in DVD and digital download format at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. All right. Uh, I want to go back quickly here to this article. I'm trying to squeeze everything in. All right. How are you all doing today? Okay. So uh, a 2019 Associated Press NORC uh, Center for Public Affairs Research poll found 74% of African Americans support uh, reparations, but less than one fifth uh, do not. It's not just reparations for slavery, it's reparations for slavery and the legacy of slavery, Jim Crow segregation, redlining, discrimination, et cetera. The, the continuation, what happened after slavery that brings us up to the day and deals with the structural inequities today is not just for slavery that ended 156 years ago. Maryland resident uh, Linda Davis believes a lack of education, a lack of education on the subject of slavery keeps many white Americans from supporting the effort. She's correct because most Americans are, are, Americans are woefully ignorant of history, regardless of race. A lot of our people still think Willie Lynch historically existed. Willie Lynch never historically existed. Okay. Um, Davis, uh, Linda Davis believes a lack of education on the subject keeps many white Americans from supporting the effort. And Linda Davis is white. She belongs to uh, coming to the table, coming to the table, a national organization made up of descendants of those who were enslaved and slave and slave holders coming to the table, a national organization made up of descendants of those who were enslaved and the descendants of slave holders. Linda Davis said, I think getting people to make that leap is sometimes a challenge. OK. And she and she submitted a written testimony in support of the state reparations effort. She said it's trying to help people see the ongoing harms like this summer. I, I, I think uh, uh, summer 2020, I think more white people are getting in now, which is hard because it seems like people should have gotten it before now. I, I, I think more I think more white people are getting it now. IT. I think more white people are getting it now, she said, which is hard because it seems like people should have already gotten it before now. Now, uh, Linda Davis uh, points to local efforts as an example of what grassroots activism around the issue of reparations can achieve. In March, we know we talked about Evanston, Illinois here in March. In the reparations program, the city council passed to deal with a history of redlining. It's not dealing with the history of slavery. It's dealing with a history of redlining because slavery did not exist in Evanston, Illinois. Evanston, Illinois was founded in the 1840s. And slavery was abolished in Illinois in 1818. And I interviewed uh, right here on this show, I interviewed um, Fifth Ward Alderwoman Robin Ruth Simmons, who was the one who spearheaded the reparations initiative in Evanston, Illinois. So go watch that entire interview and we get deep into the history and actually what happened and why they dealt with redlining and the whole proposal that they put together dealing with redlining, that is based upon a 77 page study dealing with the history of redlining in Evanston, Illinois. That wasn't just something they pulled out of the air. That was based upon research that dealt with the 77. That information came from a 77 page study. And I have the study here somewhere. That came from a 77 page study that dealt with the history of redlining in Evanston, Illinois. 
and the effects of redlining. So a lot of people were commenting on it and didn't do the research and didn't know what they were talking about. I can't find it. It's somewhere around here. Uh, but go watch that full interview. Now, this document right here, this study, you've heard me talk about it before, and I use this also in the online class. And in some of my lectures, I reference it. Teaching Hard History, American Slavery. Teaching Hard History, American Slavery from the Southern Poverty Law Center. Teaching Hard History, American Slavery. This uh, is about a 52-page study. This fairly documents how the history of slavery is being incorrectly taught in schools all across the country. And then it lays out numerous recommendations on how to more correctly teach that history. And they did a survey of 1000 high school seniors and they found that uh, America's school children know very little about the history of slavery. They found that only 8% of high school seniors surveyed could identify slavery as the central cause of the U.S. Civil War. They found that only two thirds or 68 uh, percent did not know that it took a constitutional amendment to formally end slavery, the 13th Amendment. Only 22 percent of high school seniors surveyed could correctly identify how provisions in the U.S. Constitution gave advantages to slaveholders like Article One, Section Two, Clause Three of the U.S. Constitution, known as the Three Fifths Compromise which dealt with apportionment, determining how many seats in the House of Representatives slaveholding states would have and also dealt with taxation. OK, so you can go to Southern Poverty Law Center's website, SPLcenter.org, SPLcenter.org. And search for Teaching Hard History American Slavery, Teaching Hard History American Slavery. You can uh, download that. Uh, you can download the uh, study. I took it to a printer, got to print it. Also, the chair of the advisory board that put this study together is Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries. Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries is a nephew, one of my teachers, Dr. Lena Jeffries. And I've interviewed Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries here on the show also. Every, I think every school and every school district in the country should be using this study. If they did, they wouldn't do things like mock slave auctions. And they wouldn't engage in a lot of these exercises that are traumatizing to african-american children when it comes to slavery it tells you don't do don't do things like slave reenactments and mock slave auctions etc because that's traumatizing to students especially african-american students okay so check out the rest of this article here from um the griot.com we're almost out of time here check out the rest of this article despite Racial reckoning, state efforts stall on reparations. Despite racial reckoning, state efforts stall on reparations. And this why this is why the state legislature and voting the right people into the state legislature are so important also, as well as the governor, because the bill has to be signed in the law, has to be signed in the law by the governor. I bet you if Stacey Abrams had become governor of Georgia, she would have vetoed Senate Bill 202 the voter restriction bill in uh, Georgia. Okay, I bet she would have vetoed Senate Bill 202. Uh, lastly, let's look quickly at this uh, article here from, uh, this one from facetofaceafrica.com. Uh, Germany is returning to Nigeria um, Bronze artifacts and bronze statues. Okay, you may have we posted about this on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. Let me flip over to this, and also uh, quickly here, also at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, right on the home page, it has the information for the um, uh, online course that I teach, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Mahafa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. That's right on the homepage as well. Okay. So we'll pull that up quickly. So when you go uh, to the homepage and scroll down, you see the information for a uh, radio show on six days a week. Click here to listen to audio podcasts of the shows. Click here to read articles I've written. 
This is uh, the May, the March 15th show where I dealt with Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion performing WAP at the Grammys and Negative Corporate Control Hip Hop. Information here, okay. Click here to register. We did class one on March 1st. Uh, click here to enroll. As soon as you, as soon as you uh, register for the class, you can watch um, uh, the class on March 1st, okay. And the course offerings we did in um, February and March. You can watch that as well. All right. Let me, I want to look at this last uh, article here. This is from face2faceafrica.com. Uh, I saw an article from CN CNN Africa about this as well. And then also um, I have one here from the BBC. So Germany is returning to Nigeria artifacts stolen by the British. Germany is returning to Nigeria artifacts stolen by the British. All right. This is from April 30th, 2021. Here's some artifacts right here. Uh, the Benin Eth uh, Ethno Ethnological Museum in Germany holds more than 530 pieces of the famous Benin artifacts stolen by the British troops as they colonized what is now Nigeria. Okay, as they colonized what is now Nigeria. Now, Germany will now return to, uh, Nigeria, to Nigeria artifacts that were stolen in 1897 by troops in the thick of British colonization efforts in the West African uh, country. It was announced by German culture minister Monika uh, Gruters on Thursday, April 29, 2021. The Ethnological Museum alone in Berlin holds over 530 artifacts in this, in this category. After they were looted, Britain auctioned many of the artworks to museums in Europe and in the United States. OK. Over the last decade, there have been calls supported by many European politicians to return the artifacts to Nigeria. Now, I suggest you also give back the money that you got from selling the stolen artifacts in the first place. You're going to give back the artifacts. You're going to give back the money, too. I suggest you do. The Ethnological Museum alone in Berlin holds over 530 artifacts in this category. After they looted, after the British looted these artifacts, Britain auctioned many of the artworks to museums in Europe and in the United States. So they made money off of the looted artifacts. Now, announcing the deal reached with the Nigerian government, Gruters said her country wanted to, quote, contribute to understanding and reconciliation with the descendants of those whose cultural treasures were stolen, end quote, during the European occupation of Africa. The artworks that will be returning to Nigeria from 2022, the year 2022, are usually collectively called the Benin bronzes, although some are made of ivory. Now, what about the money? What about the money that you made from auctioning off stolen artifacts from my ancestors? What about the money? Show me the money. Yes, yeah, send the artifacts back, but we, we should get some of that money too. The Benin King Kingdom of old is not related to the Republic of Benin even if some of the peoples in the modern sovereign state are descendants of the Benin people who flourished between the 11th and 16th centuries on the west coast of Africa. Since the beginning of the last decade, there has been increasing international pressure, increasing international pressure on European and American museums to give back Africa's priceless pieces of cultural heritage. This was dealt with a little bit in the film Black Panther in the museum scene. Okay. 
This is dealt with a little bit in the film Black Panther for Marvel Comic Universe, Black Panther. In 2018, the French government released a report by a commission it has set up to investigate the matter of returning stolen artifacts in uh, French ownership. Senegalese economist uh, Felwin Saar, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce the name, and French historian uh, Benedict Savoy concluded that some 90% of known material arts of ancient Africa are outside of the continent. Now, I remember when that study came out because we posted an article at uh, the African History Network on Facebook about this. Okay, some 90% of known materials of ancient Africa are outside of the continent of Africa. They're in these European controlled museums. It was the first time the weight of the matter had been put into quantifiable perspective. Yet for those who had hopes that restitution would be quickened, they have been disappointed. For those who had hopes that restitution would be quickened, they have been disappointed. Although museums and countries have said they are committed to returning the artworks, the process has been slow. How about returning some of that money that you made from the stolen artworks? One of the reasons for this has been attributed to the unavailability of technological conditions in African museums to receive the artifacts. That notwithstanding, the calls have continued to come in. The British Museum, which holds nearly a thousand Benin artifacts, says it is, quote, committed to facilitating a permanent display of Benin material, end quote. They, they are committed to facilitating a permanent display of Benin material. But they have not explained how this will be facilitated. So check out this article here from facetofaceafrica.com. Germany is returning to Nigeria artifacts stolen by British colonizers. Germany is returning to uh, Nigeria artifacts stolen by Br British colonizers. Uh, the British colonizers, doesn't that include the, uh, the royal family? Remember, remember when I said Meghan Markle married into a family of colonizers? And I said, I'm not calling them colonizers because they're white. I said, I'm calling them colonizers because Great Britain, a hundred years ago, colonized one fifth of the world's population. One fifth of a hundred years ago, one fifth of the world's population lived under British rule. So I'm calling them colonizers because they colonized one fifth of the world population. Okay, I'm not calling them colonizers because they're white. Don't I don't want you to misunderstand this. I'm calling them colonizers because they colonized one fifth of the world population. All right, well, look, guys, we have to, uh, brothers and sisters, we have to get out of here. Remember to uh, register for the online course that I teach, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. It meets Saturdays, uh, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Saturdays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, it meets all around. Uh, you can watch from all around the world. Um, it is an online course. All the sessions we do the, do the class live. All of the sessions are recorded, so you can go back and watch it over and over again. Okay, all the sessions are recorded, so you can go back and watch it over and over again. And uh, next class is going to be uh, Saturday, uh, May eighth. 12 noon Eastern Standard Time. We had a uh, we had a great class uh, Saturday March uh, Saturday May, May 1st. As soon as you register, you can watch the class from Saturday May 1st. And I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have uh, uh, book references, articles, um, everything. Okay. 
All right, we have to get out of here. Remember, the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Uh, if you want to advertise with the African History Network, also email us at ahnshow at 